real power. Real power. And it's because of my belief that I haven't seen more of it in my life. And I believe that that's the way we should approach it. It's my ignorance of the Scripture that I don't know more of the Word of God that I should know to understand that power. That's why the Apostle Paul said that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection. Look at the book of Genesis, chapter number 2 with me tonight, please, in verse number 20. Galatians 2.20, rather. The book of Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. The apostle said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. That's an enigma, but it's a fact nonetheless. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave, note carefully, himself for me. The reason the Lord Jesus Christ gave himself is because no one else could be a perfect sacrifice. God demanded. God demanded absolute obedience. Only one did that. God demanded a complete, pure sacrifice. Only one could meet that qualification. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, offered Himself without spot to God. The Bible said through the eternal Spirit He offered Himself unto the Father. So therefore, when the Lord Jesus gave Himself, He gave Himself by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. He did not leave behind monuments. You can't find one anywhere. He did not believe behind any kind of a stone or anything like that that he had blessed that you could go to and touch. He did not believe he did not leave behind any holy artifacts that you might hold in your hand and say, I have here something that was his and it has power in it. There is no power but the power of Christ. And that power is manifested through the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says, The life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. For that one who denies the Word of God, He still gave Himself for them because the Bible says that they deny the Lord that bought them. So He gave Himself for all mankind and would have all to be saved. I'm glad for that, that He gave Himself. I'm glad that for everything that we have a relationship with God about, He's the first in it. In other words, He originates it. He's the first of it. He's the author of it. He designs it. He brings it to fruition. No man seeketh after the Lord. A man seeks about for his own entitlement or for his own joy, or for his own peace, for his own good, for his own whatever selfish reason he may have. No man seeketh after the Lord. That's put into your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit to desire to know Him. So Himself, He gave Himself for me. Thank God for that. The government didn't die for me. The school system didn't die for me. Education didn't die for me. Men didn't die for me. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Christ died for me. And the Bible says that He died for me according to the Scriptures. So Himself makes it very personal. And this is a personal thing between you and the Lord. It's not about some idea, some thought, some salvation that you embrace. It's a person that you embrace. And that's what salvation is about. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. To the Catholic, to the Episcopalian, to the Baptist, to the Lutheran, to the Church of Christ, Church of God, Assemblies of God, whoever, I'd say to you as I say to myself, salvation is not in your church, it's not in your doctrine, it's not in your preachers, it's not in your sacraments, it is in Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. So He gave Himself for me. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 20, here's what the Scripture says, Ephesians 2.20. We're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. He is the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church, folks, is not built upon me. I'm here today and gone tomorrow. It's not built upon some great man, some great work, some great movement, some great doctrine. The church of God is built upon Christ. And the Scripture says that He's the chief cornerstone. Now, any of you that are Masons, you know you have to have a starting point. That stone has to be right. Whether it be a block or whether it be a brick or whether you're laying rock or whatever, you'd better have a line. You'd better have it right. Because everything else in that building is going to come off of that line. And if that line's wrong, the rest of it will be wrong. So that cornerstone has got to be right. Because the cornerstone is not only a foundational stone, but the cornerstone is a directive stone. It directs for the rest of the stone's fall. And I'm built upon that foundation. I've been placed on that stone. Hallelujah to God. I am in that body and I am in that building. 
fitly framed together according to the Word of God and according to the will of God. But I'll tell you one thing right now, make no mistake about it. The chief cornerstone was right. He was laid right. He is right. He started right. He will be right. It'll all be right about him. It'll never be wrong. It'll never deviate from the truth or right. If he said it's true, it's true. If he made it right, it's right. It's not subject to pop culture and pop theology and whatever may, may be passing down the pike today that men embrace. The truth is the truth. It's the absolute truth. And Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Amen. So that's what the foundation of the church is. It's built upon Christ. It's in the apostles and the prophets that are on Christ. But He is first of all and foremost. He must have the preeminence. That's why when you walk through the door, it ought to be about Christ. When you go out, you ought to take Him with you. It ought to be about Him when you're in here. You ought to praise Him and glorify His holy name. I marvel at when I see the Holy Spirit, the way He gets worked up when you work up the Lord Jesus. When you start manifesting the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of God begins to fall. The Holy Ghost comes into the world, and His purpose in this world is to glorify Christ. He'll not speak of Himself. You preach the Lord Jesus, and you will see the power of God. I've been in churches all my life. And I was saved into a church down there at Third Creek Baptist Church. And I've been in all kinds of churches and revivals, been in camp meetings, been here and been there. And folks, some meetings I walked away with a distinct impression. It was about a man. Or I walked away with a distinct impression. Well, it was about his standards. Or I walked away with a distinct impression. It was about his school. Or I walked away with a distinct impression. He sure knows a lot of stories. Or I walked away with a distinct impression that it was about everything but Christ. Like everything but the Lord Jesus. And I ask you a question tonight. Since you feel like it's necessary to preach all this other stuff instead of Christ, you must feel like it's more important than the Lord Jesus. The thing is this. Everything has its place. All of this has its place. But Christ is first place. He's the chief cornerstone. And everything as it's preached should be preached as it relates to the Lord Jesus. Right? When a man preaches the Ten Commandments, thank God for the Ten Commandments. But don't ever preach the Ten Commandments without preaching the Lord Jesus. Because nobody ever kept the commandments. And if all you do is preach the Ten Commandments to a bunch of people and never preach Christ to them, you're going to preach a bunch of puffed up self-righteous Pharisees that somehow or another feel like that they're keeping the commandments of God. And only one ever kept them. The Lord Jesus Christ. Compare the commandments to Him. He said, I didn't come to do away with the law, but to do what with it? Fulfill it. And that's exactly what we... The Bible says that He is... Uh, that that that. Christ is the chief cornerstone. Isaiah chapter number 28 verse 16 is beautiful when it talks about this. If you'd like to turn there. Isaiah chapter number 28 and verse number 16. In relation to this cornerstone. Listen to this. Therefore thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone. Watch this. A tried stone. A precious cornerstone. A sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. He's tried. He's precious. And he's pure. Hallelujah. The book of Luke chapter number 24 and verse number 15. This is his book. Did you know that? If I open up the Bible and I don't preach Christ, what am I doing? <laughs> he wrote the book. He said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify the commandments. Did I mess up? Did I mess up? I messed up, didn't I? Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. For they are they that testify of the church. I messed up again, didn't I? What does the Bible say? Search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of what? Me. The Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter number 24 and verse number 15. The Bible said it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus Himself drew near and went with them. Himself. He came nigh to those two on the road to Emmaus. That's one of the most beautiful scenes in all the Bible. Here are disciples of the Lord with a limited knowledge. They believe, but only so far. They had plenty of doubt because of what had just happened and transpired. They couldn't put it together. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't, they couldn't connect the dots. And so they walked in doubt. They had an element of faith. They had a smoking flax or bruised reed. There was enough faith about them to believe. But all oh, they'd cry out, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. So what did he do? How did he help their unbelief? The Bible said he opened to them the Scriptures. And the Scriptures said that when, they, when the Word of God was opened to them, they said to each other, did not our heart burn within us when he opened to us the Scriptures? He opened the Word of God. You know that book that's full of myths? He opened the Word of the living God. 
the living word of the living God, by the way. The word of God is quick. He opened it to them, and they said our hearts burned within us. Our hearts still burn within us. May God open his word to us. It takes the Lord Jesus to open the word. It's not an intellect that opens the Bible. It's, uh, it's fashioned in such a way the intellect can't open it. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that upbraideth not. The word of God is understood spiritually. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost can open up the deep truths, yea, the deep truths of the word of God. And every time one opens, your heart burns in you. I was reading like the book of Genesis last night when Abraham stood outside of Sodom and Gomorrah. I've been through that time and time and time and time again. And I saw the intercessors. He pled for them. Came all the way down to ten souls. If there's just ten, Abraham said, just ten, would you spare it? And the Lord said, I'd spare it for ten. That's a remarkable thing. But when I continued reading in there, God showed me something I had never seen before. It just jumped off of the pages of the Bible, knocked me back in my seat. And I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I mean, I'm <laughs> boy, it was good. It was. It was so good. It was. It's one of those things that when you see it, you say, how didn't I see that before? Why didn't I see that before? Why didn't I see that before? It's good, though. Amen. That's why when I say open the Bible, turn to any place in it, it's all good. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Amen. The Scriptures. The Scriptures. He took them to the Scriptures. He said in the book of Luke 24, verse 25, he said, Oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ first to have suffered? And then entered into his glory. Amen. You see that suffering and the glory are two distinct separate things. Separated by right now 2,000 years of time. But in the Bible it's not that easy to see. Yet if you read the scriptures you realize that there is a suffering Messiah. And there's a reigning Messiah. And the Jew to this day is hard pressed to, come, to, 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 to put the two together. So many of the Jew, Jewish rabbis teach that there's a suffering Messiah. And that there is a reigning Messiah. They've got two Messiahs. And the reason they do that is because there is so many scriptures that refer to him suffering, but also to him reigning. So how can he suffer and reign? It has to be two separate times. And that's what he showed them. Amen. Now, Christ not to enter and suffered first, then enter into his glory. He showed them how to divide the word of God. He showed them the division. What he did by doing that was showed them the reason he had to suffer at the cross. He made sense of his crucifixion for them. He explained to them how that he had to go to the tree and pay for the sins of mankind, but he's going to come back again. They sat down to meet and said, would you please eat with us? Oh, I'll be glad to. And they began to break bread, bread, and he blessed it, and then all of a sudden he was gone. Boy, I'd love to sit down to meet with him, wouldn't you? He said, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open that door, I'll come in and sup with him. He with me. He's ever present if you want to, ha if you want to invite him into your home. He'll come in. He really will. He'll come in. You see, this is why he left no monuments. He left no, he left no, he left no uh, buildings. He, he didn't leave anything behind of any physical uh, value whatsoever. No monetary value. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, I know. They've got 10,000 pieces of the cross. They've got three heads of John the Baptist. One when he was, a hu one when he was an adult. One when he was a boy. You know, <laughs> two different skulls. They've got all kinds of stuff. These are called religious relics. They got all this stuff, you know the, you know the, you know the, uh, the uh, what's that cup, the, the cup, the shroud of Turin, and the cup, the chalice, and all that. They've got all that stuff, okay. But you see, my friend, it's not stuff he left us. He gave us himself. We have him. If you truly know him, you have him. Amen. And he's not bought and sold. He's not out on the chop block. No, sir. No, no. He's not. He's not up for sale. You don't find him down at the agora. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself will come into the heart of a man or a woman that truly believes. He that hath the Son hath life. In Luke chapter number 24 and verse number 36, look what it says here in the Scriptures. Luke 24 verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus Himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Well, now when it began... They came to the tomb and the angel sat by and said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. According to the scriptures, as he said, he's not here. You're not going to find him here. He's not dead. So the angels announced his resurrection. But when Mary stood at the garden tomb, he appeared to her as a gardener. But then he said her voice, her name, Mary. And that's all it took. 
And she said, Rabboni. Rabboni, great teacher. My master, my Lord. Master. All right. He manifested himself to Mary. She was the first one to see the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Went back and told the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Some of them said, no telling where she's been. The poor thing, been crying her head off. You know, her eyes are swollen shut, red with tears. I'm sure she's hallucinating. I know she wants to see him so bad. Okay, Mary, come on in. We'll, we'll talk with you. They, 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 you know, they, 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 they patronized her. Come on in, Mary. Well, my friend, she did see him. And when he left the two on the road to Emmaus, the same day, just a little while later, he appeared to the disciples. And boy, it wasn't an angel announcing. It was Christ himself. That's what it says in Luke chapter number 24, verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus stood himself, stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Boy, isn't that something? Let me see here. Look over here in John. I wanna, I'm just doing this to see if we can find a connection here with John. John, chapter number 20 and verse number 21. John 20, verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. My, he'd been dead, but now he's breathing again. And saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. You remember when he breathed into Adam's nostrils a breath of life, and Adam became a living soul? That gave him his identity. He became a being. He became a being because God breathed into him. Well, when the Lord Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost, they did. They received the Holy Ghost right then and there. As a commission to apostles, apostolic succession started at this moment. This is where I fall out with a lot of the Baptists because they don't believe anything. But I'm going to tell you something right now. When he breathed on them and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost, and said, Whosoever sins you remit, they shall be remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they shall be retained. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. There is no indication of Scripture anywhere that that ever stopped. That apostolic succession goes down to every last Christian on this earth. There is no such thing as some church set aside with some hand-picked group that have some special powers from God. Everything that was there at the resurrection of Christ is for you. It is yours. It is yours. You're the church of God, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. There is unbelievable power right at your hands and in your mouth when you make a confession. Make a confession of faith. The power of God is in the church, not the world. The light of the world is the church, not the world. The salt of the earth is the church, not the world. And he said, I give you power over unclean spirits. No power of the enemy can touch you. And so my friend, he met with him and he said, Peace be unto thee. First Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse number 16. You say, well, I don't understand all that. Don't either, but I believe it. Here's the, way th here's the way things work. They, ought, they do with me. And I, maybe it'll help you. I'll believe something long before I've got it all figured out. Now, I don't know if, if you're like that or not. I believe God, believe in Him, and believe Christ, and I sure don't have Him all figured out. But I believe Him. And I, there's an awful lot of things in the Bible that I believe that I can't put all together, and I can't figure them out, but I still believe it. You see, because I believe the Word. I believe the Bible. Now, if you, have to, if you have to intellectually figure it all out and put it all together in your mind, then it's really not God's Word you're believing, and it's not God you're trusting. You're trusting in yourself. You really are. And you've got to be awful careful with that because with that you become the final judge. And it's not you that's the judge. It's the Word's the judge. The Word of God. This is why the Bible says in the book of 1 Timothy, when the Old Testament prophets prophesied, they desired to look into those things that they prophesied, but couldn't. He said that. He said they, 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 they sought to see them, but couldn't because it wasn't for them. But what they were saying was true, you see. So God has his, had His time to reveal them. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I read to you from the book of Isaiah where it says that <clears throat> they that sleep in the dust shall arise. They'll arise and they'll sing. Long gone. Long forgotten. The generations that knew them are long gone, folks. If you didn't find a piece in, a piece in history or a headstone, you wouldn't know they even lived. He does. He does. That which is highly esteemed among men's abomination to God. Probably, and I'm not, uh, I, li I love history, and I'd say probably out of the historical character, characters that I've read about, there's a number of them that I have great respect for. Believe me, I do. And I, and I like to re study the biographies of people because you learn a great deal about life and about God in their lives by studying their biographies. But probably on an average, it's no more than 30, maybe 40% at the most, of the people that you study in history that's uh, worth a dime. Most of them just a bunch of garbage. But they were, they, were, they were big in the eyes of men. They made a name on this earth. But you've got to remember that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. Amen. How many souls have gone on that you never heard about? How many, how many that you never heard? How many missionaries? I just talked to a man a few minutes ago. That man lives in North Carolina. He doesn't want you to know his name. You never will know his name probably. He said, I want to give $10,000 to Tommy Tillman. He said, I heard he's over there and he wants to build a church. I heard he's over there and he wants to do something for God. He said, this is not my money. This is God's money. I said, well, praise the Lord. I said, we'll get a hold of Tommy Tillman. We'll send, we'll, we'll send a check to him. Make sure he sends us a, a uh, receipt back so I can send it to you. Let you know he got the money. He said, this is God's money and God's been working all over me. He said, he's worked me over now for I don't know how long. He said, he wants me to send him that money. I said, glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, I don't anybody know. He said, they don't need to know my name. He said, this is for the glory of God. You wouldn't believe how refreshing that was for me to hear from, hear from somebody that didn't blow themselves up, that didn't paint some big, huge picture about what a great man they are. You've got to remember something, folks. An awful lot of God's work gets done that way. You never hear about them. You don't know them. You're not going to know them. You're not going to know anything about it till the judgment seat of Christ. That's the good part. That's the good thing. I, I embrace that. When I find somebody that's not, that's not some kind of a puffed up, self-loving person, you know, that wants recognition, that, that inspires me because I know that's the power of God. I thank God for it. That's the power of God. $10,000. I'm sure Brother Tillman can use it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, how many of you ever heard of Gehazi? In the Old Testament. He was the servant of a prophet. He was a servant of a prophet. That prophet went to the north and he healed by the power of God a man who had leprosy. Naaman. And, and Naaman was a rich man. And the Bible says that Naaman was, said, now what can I give you here? <laughs> you know, I'm healed. He dipped seven times in the Jordan River. And he was clean and he tickled to death. He said, here, I, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. And the prophet said, no, I don't want anything. I don't want any of your money. I got God. Don't need your money. Keep your money. God bless you. See you later. And he left. His servant Gehazi left with him. But they got a little ways away and Gehazi got to thinking, boy, if I had some of that money, man, I had some of that money, I could uh, talk gone. We could do a good thing for the Lord. Hallelujah. I mean, just think what all we could do if we had that money. So he went back. And Gehazi went back to Naaman and said, my servant changed his mind. And he has said that we need this for this and this for this and this for that. And, and Naaman said, well, good. Well, I'm glad to give it to you. Gave him the money. And Gehazi turned around. The Almighty saw it. Oh, boy, the prophet said to him, what have you done, Gehazi? The leprosy that was on Naaman will be on you. See, God doesn't do it that way. He doesn't do it the way men do it. You don't have to politic people and get their money. I knew a man that politicked a man. And I'm not the judge, but I just observe. He politicked an old man to get the money from that old man for the glory of God, to do the work of God. Politicked that old man to get his money so he could do the work of God. And he was dead in a couple of years. Mm. 
So you know what are you going to do? I just let it come and let it go and let God supply the need as God supplies the need and shout hallelujah, glory to God and not worry about it. God's taking care of us. Amen. Amen. That's why it's not about money every time you come in here. Some churches, that's all you hear. Money, 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 money. You get so tired of hearing about money, 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 money. Well, you can't do anything for God without money. Who are you kidding? Who told you that? You kidding? How much did the Lord Jesus do for God? He didn't have a dime in his pocket. And the only time he ever handled money was to pay taxes. And how did he get that money? And the first time he came up against money, he took a cat of nine tails or a whip and he drove the money changers out of the temple. Money was flying left and right. I can see him running over there grabbing money, sticking in their pocket. Good night, man. Grabbing that money. And yet the Lord drove them out of there. He said, my father's house, the house of prayer, you made it a den of thieves. Amen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the church of God could operate without a dime? Amen. Ephesians 5.27 Ephesians 5.27 That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. He's going to present it to himself a glorious church. And how many of you men are married men? Better get that hand up fast when you raise it. I'll look around here like that. All right, now, how many of you men walked your bride down the aisle? You did? Well, that's an unusual. You walked your bride down the aisle? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've never been in a meeting like that yet. <laughs> I was just in a real pretty wedding over here in 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 in, uh, in uh, uh, Union County, but but Daddy didn't walk the bride down the aisle. I mean, he, uh, the, the groom didn't walk the bride down the aisle. Daddy did. <laughs> okay. All right. So the, the groom does not walk the bride down the aisle. All right. The father does. And if the father's not around, then a brother or somebody like that, you know, someone they choose. All right. So what happened is that the bride is presented to the groom by the family, the other family, see. And that's just, that's the way it is. That's natural. That's good. That's all fine and dandy. But there is no other family when it comes to the body of Christ. There is nobody that could present the bride to the groom. There is nobody qualified. Who would walk the bride down the aisle? Pray tell. There is nobody out there. Sorry. Nobody qualified. Nobody's good enough. You see, the father of the bride is God the Father. And the groom is the Lord Jesus. So he will present to himself a glorious church. In other words, he'll walk her down the aisle. And when he walks her down the aisle, he and his bride will both meet before the Father. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. I believe they will. I believe he'll meet with his bride before the Father. He'll have her on his arm. He'll look up at the Father. Say, so here she is. And when she stands before the Father with the Son, she'll be perfectly welcome and perfectly ready and perfectly qualified to meet the Father and the Son. His bride. He only has one bride. He'll not walk another one. He doesn't wait till the end of tribulation to make up another bride. He doesn't wait till the end of the millennium to make up another bride. Just one. That's you. And when he calls his bride home, it's over. And at the judgment seat of Christ, it's finished. And the marriage supper of the Lamb, that does it. No more after that. He'll have guests about, but just one bride. That's you. He will present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That means he's preparing his bride right now. He's preparing her exactly the way he wants her to look. Now, I've never seen a groom do that. I've come out of this room over here and other places with the groom, and he hadn't seen what she looked like because it's not, you know, it's, it's tradition. is you don't look at, they, they don't see the bride the day of the wedding. Grooms don't prepare their brides. Uh, I guess the bride's maids or whoever helps the bride, prepare, helps the bride, prepare the bride. But he prepares the bride. He prepares his own bride. He decks her about with jewels, cleans her up, 
shines her up, makes her look good. What he does is cover her with the glory of God. And he will present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. In other words, to himself. Now, I can't figure out exactly everything's involved in that, but I believe it's going to be probably the most precious time in his life is when he gets his bride. You see, the salvation of mankind could be done without a bride, but he wants a bride. He will have a bride. And that bride is the body of Christ. Therefore, it's bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Have a spiritual union with him that nobody else has, ever had or will have or has had. It's his body. He talks about a man's a human bride and groom. says, no man ever hated his own flesh. If, a, if you're married to a woman, you're, she's bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. And two become one, saith the Lord. Well, that one is what happens when we become one with Christ. I don't know what it is, but there's an exaltation waiting for the church, brethren. There is a place with the bride nobody else has. It's a, he said, I will present to myself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. He's going to present himself a bride. That means he's purging the bride, cleansing the bride, sanctifying the bride, getting the bride ready. And when he does present that bride to him, no more will be done. There will be no judgment seat of Christ after that. The judgment seat of Christ will be before that. It's over when that happens. It's finished. And when they see you in eternity, they're going to know that at one time you were a human being like them. But not anymore, not anymore. No longer are you just a human being. You see, a human being is a being of the earth. We're sons of God by the new birth. If you hear some preacher, all he talks about human beings and human beings, and you hear of a church that is, and all it talks about human beings and human beings, they don't understand what it is to be born again. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That's something. No longer a human being, a son of God. I can look at Michael and Gabriel and all the other angels. They're all sons of God by creation. I'm a son of God by birth. Birth. He created the devil. He didn't create a devil, but he created that anointed cherub that covereth. He created him, and he fell. The Lord, the Lord Jesus said, as Satan, I saw him as lightning fall from heaven. He does not create like us that are born of him. No, no, no. We are born of him. We were literally born begotten of God. We literally originated from him, came forth from him. <laughs> we are his children. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what little I've said tonight for the glory of God. Bless your name, Holy One. God, we're not of this world. We don't identify with this world. We're not one of them. We're not. We're different, not because we try to be different. We're just different. My life did not come from this earth. It came from above. There are things in my soul and my spirit, Lord, that yearn for that which is eternal. God, we pray. In Jesus' name tonight, make your son so real. Make the Lord Jesus so, so real in this house tonight. May he come alive in our hearts. God, may he be nearer to us than our very breath. May the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the resurrected Son of God, seated at the right hand of the Father, may he become the delight of of our soul. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. And for Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen. Amen. Amen.